Good morning, friends. I hope you're in a comfortable place, and I hope that you have your Bible available. So if you need to get situated comfortably, if you need to get your Bible, um, I'll give you 30 seconds or so, and I uh, hope that you can get those things taken care of. <laughs> okay, that probably wasn't 30 seconds, but here we go. Oh, that's the official start of Grab Bag. Welcome back. I'm your host, Rob Grandy, and Grab Bag is not filmed in front of a live studio audience. <laughs> I know I'm being silly, but hey, I got to do something to entertain myself uh, this morning. Now, you can probably see behind me that there are Valentine decorations out, and you may be wondering why that is so, because, but the truth is that I recorded episodes one and two yesterday, and today is July, July, golly, Rob, I just wish it was July, oh, this winter weather, but today is February 11th, and so Valentine's Day is, has still not arrived. In fact, if you are able to get out on Sunday. I know the weather's supposed to be tough. Um, Lord willing, we'll see you on Sunday, Valentine's Day, uh, for worship. But anyway, um, you're probably seeing this, let's see, a month from now. <laughs> so um, I hope it's still applicable for you, and I still hope that you are enjoying our time together in this grab bag scenario. So, if you would, like I said the other day, or the other day in our last lesson, click on the button below, the button that isn't really a button, in order to register your attendance. I appreciate that very much. Okay, I'm going to set my timer. There you go. 30 minutes at, at the most. So we're continuing our study in John chapter 6, but first I want to take a little bit of a, it's not a rabbit trail because it's not useless, uh, I wanted, but I do want to take a sidetrack and follow another direction for a few minutes. What was John's purpose in writing the gospel? I, I hope that you've gotten that by now. John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31, where John says these miracles were written so that you can believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life in his name. So John saw Jesus' miracles as a reason for believing that Jesus was God's Son. Well, here's my sidetrack. A few years ago, Joy and I learned of an evangelistic method that's called simply RAMP, R-A-M-P, RAMP. And this morning, I want to explain it to you in order to provide you with a very simple framework for talking to someone about Jesus. Someone may ask you why you believe Jesus is the Son of God. Or you may have a conversation with an opportunity to initiate a simple explanation as to why you believe Jesus is the Son of God. And here is an easy peasy structure to guide your thoughts. RAMP, which as you probably figured out is an acrostic. And it stands for Resurrection, Apostles, miracles, and prophecy. Resurrection, apostles, miracles, and prophecies. So let's look quickly, first of all, at resurrection. Now, obviously, the resurrection is the number one reason to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Um, there are numerous aspects of the empty tomb that cannot be explained away by any means other than a resurrection occurred. 
And we're not going to go into that right now. But it's a fascinating study. And I would recommend that you do so, not just to uh, build up rationale for how to convince somebody of the that the resurrection happened or even to convince somebody that Jesus is the son of God. But it's a fascinating study just to build up your own faith and to undergird your own faith with some solid rationale. So I would recommend that to you. Um, no other person, no other person who's walked on this earth ever predicted their own means of death their own death and resurrection, and then came back for 40 days after the resurrection to prove that they were alive. Only Jesus did that. And Jesus' resurrection proves his divine sonship. So that's R. Letter A, of course, stands for apostles. Now, the 12 disciples, apostles, they they were often confused, even though they were faithful. Um, you know, being a disciple isn't easy. And there were times that Jesus was frustrated with the disciples. I'm thinking about the gospel account that, said, that Jesus said, like he said with Philip, have I been so long with you and you still don't get this? <laughs> you know, do you ever get frustrated with your kids? You know, the apostles, they weren't exactly very good at being disciples as they started out, but they were faithful. At Jesus' arrest, they scattered, abandoning, abandoning and denying him. After his resurrection, the Bible records that they were hiding in a room, afraid of being arrested and killed. Matthew, in chapter 28, verse 16, says, that after the resurrection, the 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. And when they saw Jesus, they worshiped him. Yeah. But then Matthew says this, some doubted. Huh? What? They're worshiping him, but they doubted. Amazing. No? But at least honest. You know, I worship Christ. But there are days that I have my doubts. And I, I think you're probably in that same boat. Even at that late hour, some of the disciples were skeptical. Yet the end result is that every one of the disciples died for Jesus. They died for the one in whom they trusted. At least one of the apostles would have recanted or produced a stolen body uh, from the tomb, or in some way would have done something to save his own skin, unless they were absolutely certain that Jesus had risen from the dead. I mean, what are the chances of 100% participation in martyrdom for the sake of a lie? So the resurrection the apostles and their faithfulness to Christ and their willingness to die for him, those are, they give testimony to the div divinity of Jesus. Thirdly, miracles. And here's why I decided to take this trail, because John says that his miracles prove that Jesus is the son of God. And we've already emphasized that Jesus and John put those miracles up as proof of his divinity. Jesus's miracles, friends, they were not like a sideshow act. <laughs> you know, hey, watch what I can do. He wasn't seeking, seeking large crowd attention and so decided to do some miracles. In fact, you remember the temptations in Matthew chapter 4. Jesus was taken to a high pinnacle of the temple. And Satan said, just go ahead and throw yourself down because the Bible says that, you know, you won't die. That angels will catch you up before your feet touch the ground. And just, and the, the extrapolation of that thought is that Jesus, the temple is the center point for all of Jewish worship. 
So when you jump off here and you don't die, you're going to get all kind of attention and people are going to worship you. They're in a worshipful mood. They're right here. in the. What better place for you to prove that you're the son of God than to jump off of this temple? Jesus' miracles, they weren't for getting attention. In fact, uh, about Jesus' first miracle, where he changed water to wine, John wrote this in chapter 2. What Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. So that miracle accomplished its purpose. The disciples believed in him, but the first miracle was done in Cana of Galilee. It wasn't done out where Gee, he's going to get a large crowd. You know, it was done behind the scenes where Jesus turned the water to wine and then somebody took the wine out to the larger crowd. So it, it, Jesus was not doing miracles just to do miracles, to get attention. Every miracle had a divine purpose. Oftentimes they were to help people, but always, every time, they were to teach a lesson, and one primary lesson was that Jesus was the Son of God. So we have the resurrection, we have the apostles, we have the miracles, and then finally, P, which would be prophecies. Luke records in chapter 24 that Jesus said to the disciples, after his resurrection, he opened their minds to understand the scripture, and in verse 27 of chapter 24, we read, Beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. Over 300 prophecies in the Old Testament were about Jesus. Now, there are distract detractors that maintain Jesus was a, 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 just a good student of the Old Testament, let's put it that way, that he knew all of the prophecies. And so after he was born, he made a mission to go around and fulfill all of these prophecies so that people would see him as the Messiah. He would just kind of fool them and trick them into believing he was the Messiah. But if you think about the logic of that, it's absolutely ridiculous especially when you think of a few of the prophecies that were about, for instance, his mother being a virgin, about his town of birth being Bethlehem, about how he would be taken to Egypt uh, a couple years after his birth. <laughs> In other words, who can decide who their mother's going to be? Who can decide where the place of birth is going to be. Who can decide that the parents are going to take them off to a foreign nation? You, know, it, you, you can't fulfill those after you're born. And you can't obviously predict them before you're born. So how does Jesus fulfill those prophecies after his birth? Well, he doesn't. They were prophecies about him. And so there were over 300 prophecies about him as the Messiah. He could not possibly run around the countries fulfilling all of these prophecies. Okay, that's a short version, but there you have it. RAMP, R-A-M-P, Resurrection, Apostles, Miracles, and Prophecies. And it's a pretty good arsenal of information to build your own faith in Jesus, as well as to challenge a skeptic. John said that the miracles were to convince people that Jesus is the Son of God, and that is another way of saying that they are a tool of evangelism, and evangelism is the primary purpose of every Christian and the church, okay? So that's our little sidetrack, and I hope you go back, and I really do hope you go back and listen to that, write it down, and think about how this can become a framework for you um, in, in, in being evangelistic. Because that's what the church is all about. That, that's why we're called and given a great commission to make disciples. So we've been studying John's account of the all-you-can-eat bread and fish miracle that fed over 5,000 people. And perhaps this is an appropriate Lenten lesson, <laughs> although I doubt fish fries and Chick-fil-A were in vogue back then. Although 
you know, if Judas had just opened up a Chick-fil-A, maybe he wouldn't have gone around. Okay. Here's a miracle that adds to the weight of testimony in favor of Jesus being God's son. That's the feeding of the 5,000. You know, the feeding of the 5,000 is the only miracle mentioned by all the gospel writers. And that bears some investigation. Why? What is so valuable and important about that lesson, the feeding of the 5,000? But I want to take, since we've talked about evangelism, I just want to give you one consideration. A friend of mine named Tom Lawson, he's a preacher in Kentucky, pointed out that this miracle illustrates how God feeds the bread of life to hungry souls. The Bible states that Jesus blessed the loaves and the fish after giving thanks, he blessed them, and then the people were fed by the disciples. Jesus gave the loaves and the fish to the disciples, and the disciples fed the people. And so it is that God feeds spiritual food to a starving world through you and me. We have meager resources, just as they did, but when we take those resources to Jesus, he gives thanks, he blesses them, and we then have more than enough to feed others. And that's what we read in John 12, when they had all enough, when they all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, gather the pieces that are left over, let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. So everybody had more than enough. Everybody had a stomach full. Nobody was left hungry and they collected what was left over. More important than the surplus are the conclusions that people, and remember, these are people who were on their way to Jerusalem for the Passover, the conclusions that the people were drawing about Jesus. Verse 14 is a positive conclusion. John writes, after the people saw the sign Jesus performed, they began to say, surely this is the prophet who is to come into the world. The miracles are having an impact. People are recognizing that there's something special about this man named Jesus. Now, if verse 14 was a positive, then verse 15, eh, not so much. In verse 15, John writes, Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. Have you ever, did you know that? Had you ever come across this verse before? The people saw what Jesus did and they were ready to come and make him king by force. Boy, that would be a reluctant king. But they were expecting a Messiah who would be an earthly king. And when they saw what Jesus was doing, man, let's grab this guy. Let's overthrow the government. Let's, let's fight. That's not what Jesus intended. And John just gives a blanket statement that he withdrew again to a mountain by himself. So, you see, Jesus knows motives, and he sees into the hearts of people. And though he could have taken a big ego trip, he could have been flattered by their willingness to instigate an insurrection, and he could have made a quick run at an earthly kingdom. Jesus knows that their motives, though, are selfish in the long run. Why do they want him to be king? Well, if we were to jump down to verse 26, Jesus is talking to the crowd, and he says, I tell you, you're looking for me not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. See, there were some people who saw the signs and, and believed that Jesus really was sent from God. But then there were others, and this is the way it is in life, you know? For instance, you and I, it, it sounds, I don't know, arrogant maybe, and I don't mean it to be that way, but we're the ones who see the signs, and recognize Jesus as a son of God. But then there are others who see the signs and don't believe. In this case, the people who didn't believe had eaten a lot, <laughs> and they thought, man, just think, if this guy's the king, 
Just think what that'll do for us. And so they were ready to grab Jesus and make a run for setting up an earthly government. Well, anyway, in verse, that was a, that, that was a false motive, and Jesus recognized it. In verse 16, we read, when evening came, his disciples went down to the lake where they got into a boat and set off across the lake for Capernaum. But now it was dark, and Jesus had not yet joined them. A strong wind was blowing and the waters grew rough. And when they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus approaching the boat, walking on the water, and they were frightened. But he said to them, it is I, don't be afraid. And then they were willing to take him into the boat and immediately the boat reached the shore where they were heading. You know, so many sermons and lessons have been preached and taught about this text. About, as well about Peter's uh, water walk, you know. All four Gospels have the account of the storm at sea, but only Mark includes Peter's daring walk on the water. Mark's Gospel, by the way, we talk about um, context. Mark's Gospel was written as a series of events that show Jesus as a man of action. That's the context in which John writes, or Mark writes his gospel. And it is believed that many of those events were provided by Peter, that Mark was writing down what Peter was telling him. And we know Peter, you know, he was that go-getter guy. He was a man of action. And so he would have remembered events that Jesus told, especially providing a firsthand account of the miracle of walking on water and Jesus rescuing him. Now, verses 16 through 18 provide some contextual material. Look at the verses, and what six contextual clues do you find? Verses 16 through 18, just go ahead and look at them quickly. and look for six contextual clues. Okay, my timer's going, so I'll help you out. First of all, it's evening. Secondly, there's a boat, they're in a boat. Thirdly, there's a destination. They're to go to Capernaum. Fourthly, they were Jesus-less. In other words, Jesus wasn't in the boat with them. Fifthly, there was a strong wind. And sixthly, the water grew rough. So those are contextual clues that put us right there. We're able to, to feel it, to understand it, to see it perhaps in our mind's eye. Okay, if it helps you, throw some water on your face and pretend you're in the boat. The other Gospels add information for us as well. First of all, that Jesus sent the disciples out on the water while he dismissed the crowd. Now, John doesn't tell us that. One of the other Gospels does. That, Jesus, that the crowd was still there and Jesus sent the disciples out on the water and then Jesus himself dismissed the crowd. And then secondly, that Jesus went off privately. Now, John does tell us that Jesus went away by himself, but he doesn't tell us that it was after he dismissed the crowd, sent the disciples away, and he was by himself, and then he went off by himself, okay? Remember the series of events that had preceded this feeding of the 5,000. For instance, his cousin John the Baptist had been beheaded, don't know the time frame between then and now, but Jesus was grieving. Um, there was a trip from Jerusalem to Bethsaida, and uh, it, probably th they may have gone, first of all, to Capernaum, but even a trip from Jerusalem to Bethsaida would have been a trip of about 80, 87 miles, and so that was a long, arduous walk you know, and probably took four to five days. So 
and Jesus gets to Bethsaida, and all of a sudden there's crowds of people. He's heading north from Jerusalem, and they're heading south to Jerusalem. And so they stop. They see Jesus, and so the crowd comes in around him. I mean, he's, he's weary. He's worn. He's tired. He's just but yet he still teaches the crowd, feeds the 5,000. And then he sets an example for us of the value and the importance of getting alone. I mean, he could have said, hey, we did a good job here. Yay, let's go, guys. But no, he sent the disciples away and took time to revitalize, to recharge. And he went off alone to spend a little time with the Father. So what do we know about Capernaum? Well, as much as Bethany seemed to be Jesus' go-to location in Judea, Capernaum was Jesus' headquarters in Galilee. Now, I don't know, I don't know if you can see this, with the light shining as it is. Um, down here, this is Judea, okay? This is Samaria in between. And then up here, this orange, this is Galilee. Okay. This is the Dead Sea. This is the Sea, sea of Galilee. And so the Jordan River runs between them. Jesus would have gone from down around here in Jerusalem and traveled up the Jordan River to the Sea of Galilee. To the northeastern side where Bethsaida was. Did he stop in Capernaum first and then go to Bethsaida? I don't know. But it was an arduous trip, okay? So Capernaum was on, I don't know if I can even get this closer, Capernaum was down here on this side of the gown. I keep forgetting this is backwards on my screen. So Capernaum is down here on this lower side of Galilee, Sea of Galilee. I hope that makes sense. Okay, so that is where Capernaum was located. And uh, so we have some questions. Why would the disciples leave at night in a boat for Capernaum? How could they not know a storm was coming? And why would Jesus send them out if the storm was coming? Well, first of all, you got to understand the Sea of Galilee, even though it's called the Sea of Galilee, it is a freshwater lake. And it is only about six miles, six to eight miles wide. Uh, I could be more specific, I guess, if I actually drove it. But six to eight miles wide and about 13 miles long. So it's not a giant lake. You could, on a clear day, I mean, you could actually see across the Sea of Galilee. So when these guys are going from, now to me it's up here, when they're going from the northeast section down to the southwest, well, it's more south central section where Capernaum was, it was only uh, about a four to six mile boat ride, okay? Now, why would they go at night? Well, John tells us that it was evening when they left. And remember, these are seasoned fishermen who often spent nights fishing. We read about that in the Bible, that the disciples one time spent all night fishing and came home and hadn't caught anything. So they're not afraid to be out on this little lake at night. I mean, they're, you know, it's not like there are cities along the shore that are sending out electric, electric lights and that kind of thing. I mean, yeah, it's dark, but they're, they're used to that. And so they're thinking, well, we've got a short little uh, boat ride down to Capernaum, which is better than having to walk all the way around the lake to get there. So they're, they're unafraid. It's a short trip. Now, did they leave in a storm? No, they didn't leave in a storm. There was no storm when they left. Now, here's another thing about context that helps with this story. The Sea of Galilee is known, seriously, is known for sudden storms. The sea is 700 feet below sea level. 
which sounds weird that a sea would be below sea level, doesn't it? But it's 700 feet below sea level. On the northeastern side, we talk, they talk about hills, but these hills can reach nearly 1,400 feet above sea level. So you're talking about a 2,100 foot difference. It was 2,500 feet down the west side uh, of the Golan Heights and the Decapolis down to the Sea of Galilee. So this is a, a fast drop in a short amount of time. And it was not unusual that cool winds would wind down the northeast, down the slopes, and across the warm waters of the Galilee, forcing the warm air aloft. And when that happened, violent storms would arise very suddenly and without warning. I, I, I think they were called S-I-R-R-O-C-C-O, -C -C and it's Sirocco winds, that they would just pop up dive down and go right across the, the lake and the warm water. And so it would cause, I mean, we watch the, the weather on TV, you know, and it's cold front meeting the warm front, storms happen, and that's what would happen. So when the disciples left, it may have been just a, a regular night on the Sea of Galilee, but they're out there for this short ride and the violent winds come out and immediately a storm uh, pops up. So that seems to be uh, what happened. And that's why I say to you, this is context because these are things about the storm that you wouldn't know unless you did some research and you looked at simple things like climate and, and, and it helps you to understand the story better. It gives you a context. This was a storm similar to the one experienced by the disciples while Jesus was sleeping in the boat. So in the middle of the storm, Jesus goes to the disciples and he's walking on water. And that's where we're going to push pause for the day. Okay. Here is your assignment. There you go. Good. <laughs> Just in time. Here's your assignment. I know you're wishing class was over before you got your assignment, huh? Reread John 6. All of it from beginning to end, John chapter 6. Read Mark chapter 6, verses 45 through 56. John or Mark chapter six, verses 45 through 56. That's the account of Peter walking on the water. And next week, we're going to use Mark's account as a supplemental focus for our John chapter six lesson. And then I'd ask that do this. Use your imagination. I, this is something that I, I don't know, I, I do. I, I try to imagine. What would it have been like for Jesus to come from his place of solitary meeting with God, the Father, to walk down through the grass? You know, there, the Bible says there was a lot of grass there where he fed the 5,000. To walk down to the shore, and like, just kind of, you've been on the beach, you know, feel the, the sand, the, the stones underneath your feet, and then to walk out on the water. <laughs> you know, did, did he wade out up to his knees and then make a step up? Did he never even get his little itty bitty toe wet? What was that like? Imagine Jesus stepping out on the water and then just walking out onto the lake. No fear that he would get half a mile out and start sinking. So imagine 
you know, use your imagination. Imagine the disciples. Imagine you're in the boat with the disciples. <laughs> and you're rowing away. The storms come, the, you know, the white, there, there were white caps. The storms would, I read, get bad enough that there would be white caps. And so the storm is raging. And imagine you're looking over to the side and, yo, is that a ghost? Use your imagination as you read these scriptures. Put yourself there. Put yourself in the context to help you feel it, think it, and even to understand it. What's going to happen, folks, and then as we go through the next lessons, it, we go through the conclusion of John chapter 6, and you will see this if you read it ahead of time. Jesus is going to come to one of the most crucial points in his earthly ministry. And we'll point that out as we continue through this study. Hey, God bless you much. And I look forward to not seeing you next week. <laughs> I mean, I hope you'll be here, but obviously I won't see you. Take care. <laughs>